Good evening. We're going to go ahead and start with our uh, public hearing already, and I believe the first item that we have is a public comment. Uh, Terry, if I'm correct, nobody signed up for public comment? That is correct. Right All right. Thank you. Then we're going to go ahead and start with item number two, the Annual Financial Management Report 2020 Financial Integrity Rating System of Texas first. Ms. Castaneda. Yes, ma'am. Uh, for this item, we have Mr. Uh, Afonso Perez, for Assistant Superintendent for Business and Finance, who will do a presentation on Good afternoon, members of the board. Uh, we're here to report on the, on the first for the year 2020-2021, uh, and this is based, based on uh, the 2019-2020 school data. Uh, this year, uh, we've got 20 indicators. And the, the ratings range from A, B, C, and F. Superior is uh, 90 to 100. Above standard is 80, 80 to 89. And meet standard is 60 to 79. Uh, substandard is below 60. Uh, the first item, uh, the first indicator on the first is, was, a complete, was the complete annual financial report and data submitted to TEA within 30 days of the November 27th or January 28th deadline, be, that being our deadline, depending on the school district's fiscal year. And the response is uh, Don ISD's annual financial report for fiscal year ended August 31st was filed with the TEA before the deadline of February 20th, 2021. So the answer is yes to that. Was there an unmodified opinion in the annual financial report on the financial statements as a whole? The American Institute of Certified Public Accountants defines unmodified opinion. The external independent auditor determines if there was an unmodified opinion. The response is yes. The opinion expressed by our external auditors on the August 31st, 2020 audit report was an unmodified opinion. A, qualification on the financial report means that the district needs to correct some of the reporting data or financial controls. A district goal, therefore, is to receive an unmodified opinion or unqualified opinion on its annual financial report. Indicator number three. Was the school district in compliance with the payment terms of all debt agreements at fiscal year end? If the, if the school district was in a default in a prior fiscal year, an exemption applies in following years if the school district is current on its on the forbearance or payment plan with the lender and the payments are made on schedule for the fiscal year being rated. Also exempted are technical defaults that are not related to monetary defaults. A technical default is a failure to uphold the terms of a debt covenant contract or master promissory note, even though payments to the lender, trust, or sinking fund are current. A debt agreement is a legal agreement between a, a, a debtor. Uh, the response is Donna ISD has no instances of default on bonded indebtedness obligations for fiscal year 2020. The indicator seeks compliance with laws, rules, and regulations. Did the school district make timely payments to, payments to the teacher retirement system, the Texas Workforce Commission, the IRS, and other government agencies? The response is Donna ISD made timely pay payments to governmental agencies for the fiscal year ending 2020. Indicator number five <clears throat> was a total unrestricted net position balance uh, in the governmental activities column in the statement of net positions greater than zero. The response indicator is no longer being scored at all. Indicator number six was the average change in assigned and unassigned fund balances over three years less than a 25% decrease or did the current year's assigned and unassigned fund balance exceed 75 days of operational expenditures. Donna ISD's average, average change in assigned and unassigned fund balances over three years was 3.32% for fiscal year end of 2020. The indicator measures the percentage change in fund balance to see whether the fund balance is declining too quickly and if it is declining, whether sufficient fund balances remain, remains to operate for at least 75 days. We're fine with that too. Indicator number seven was the number of days of cash on hand and current investments in the general fund for the school district sufficient to cover operating expenditures. The response is Donna ISD's number of days of cash on hand is 154.27 days for fiscal year end at 2020. The indicator focuses on the solvency of the entity by, cal by calculating days cash on hand and assigns points based on a greater than or equal to 90 days being worth 10 points. We got the 10 points on that. Indicator number eight was a measure of current assets to current liabilities ratio for the school district sufficient to cover short-term debt. 
And the response is Don Izzy's measure of current assets to current liabilities ratio was 5.6582 for fiscal year 2020. The indicator uses a standard ratio in commercial lending that calculates a district's current ratio and assigns points based on, on greater than or equal to a ratio of three being worth 10 points. And then again, we got 10 points. <coughs> indicator number nine, if the school district district's fund balance, general fund revenues equal or exceed expenditures, if not, was the school district's number of days of cash on hand greater than it or equal to 60 days? The response is Donna ISD's revenue exceeded expenditures. The ratio was 4.17 for fiscal year ended 2020. The indicator seeks to prove that general fund revenues equal or exceed expenditures and assign points based on, based on greater or equal to zero being worth 10 points. And we got 10 points on that also. Indicator number 10. That did, did the school district average less than a 10% variance, 90 to 110, when comparing budgeted revenues to actual revenues for the, for the last fiscal years? For the last three fiscal years, I'm sorry. The response is Donna ISD's ratio was 1.196, a fiscal year into 2020. The indicator measures how accurately the district forecast projected revenues by comparing budgeted revenue to actual re revenue. So we, again, 10 points. Indicator number 11 was a ratio of long-term liabilities to, to total assets for the school district sufficient to support long-term solvency? The response is Donna IC's ratio of long-term liabilities to total assets was 0 0.2703 for fiscal year end of 2020. The indi indicator calculates the district's ratio of long-term liabilities to total assets and assigns points based on less, or, less than or equal to 0 0.60 being worth 10 points. And we got the 10 points. Indicator number 12, was a debt per $100 of assets property value ratio sufficient to support future debt payments, repayments? Response is yes. Donna's ISD, Donna ISD's debt per $100 of assets property value ratio was 1.7381 for 2020. The indicator asks about the school district's ability to make debt principal and interest payments. A ratio less than or equal to four is worth 10 points. And we got the 10 points. 13, was it school district's administrative cost ratio equal to or less than the threshold ratio? The response is Donna ISD's administrative cost ratio was 0 0.0711 for the fiscal year and the 2020. TEA and state laws, I'm sorry, TEA and state law sets a cap on the percentage of their budget that Texas school districts can spend on administrative, as administration based on district size. For districts in Donna ISD's category, the administrative cost ratio should fall below 0 0.0855 to be awarded the 10 points. And again, we were awarded the 10 points. Indicator number 13, did the school district not have a 15% decline in the students to staff ratio over three years? The total enrollment to total staff. If the student enrollment, enrollment did not decrease, the school district will automatically pass the indicator. The response is Donna ISD had a 8.355 increase in students to staff ratio over three years for fiscal year in the 2020. The indi indicator calculates a student to staff ratio over a three-year period and assigns 10 points if the dis district did not have a 15% decline, which we didn't, so we were at 10 points. Indicator number 59, number 15, I'm so sorry, was the school district's ADA within the allotted range of the district's biannual pupil po projections submitted to TEA? If the district did not submit pupil projections to TEA, did it certify TEA's projections? See ranges below in the determination of points section. Donna ISD had a total variance of 0 0.0012 and projected to actual ADA for fiscal year ended 2020. This indicator measures how well the district was able to project ADA for payment purposes. Projected ADA is compared to actual. So we got the full five points on that. Uh, indicator number 16, did the comparison of public education information management systems, which is PEAMS, data to like information in the school district's AFR result in a total variance of less than 3% of all expenditures by function. The response, this indicator measures the, the quality of data reported to PEAMS and then the annual financial report to make certain that the data reported in each case matches up. If the difference in numbers reported in any funds type is more than 3%, the district fails this measurement. If the district fails, the maximum number of points it may receive on its first rating is 89. We got the 10 points. Indicator number 17, did the external independent auditor report that the AFR was free of any instances of material weaknesses and in internal controls over finance, financial reporting and compliance for local, state, or federal funds? 
the response is Donna, ISD's external auditors indicated that the AFR was free of material weaknesses and internal controls over financial reporting and compliance for fiscal year 2020. This, this indicator covers material weaknesses and internal controls in local, state, and federal funds in the AFR. If the district fails this indicator, the maximum number of points it may receive on its first rating is 89. We passed it with, yes. Indicator 18, did the external independent auditor indicate the AFR was free of any instances of materials not compliance for grants, contracts, and loss related to local, state, or federal <coughs> funds? The response is Donna ISD, ISD's external auditors indicated that the AFR was free of material non-compliance for fiscal year 2020. This indicator covers material, uh, material non-compliance in local, state, and federal funds in the AFR and awards points based on, on free of any instances being worth 10 points. Then again, we got the 10 points. Indicator number 19, if the school district posts the required financial information on its website in accordance with the government code, local government code, Texas education code, Texas administrative code, and other statutes, laws, and rules that were in effect at the school district's fiscal year end. Don ISD posted the required financial information on its website for fiscal year 2020. The indicator measures whether the district is complying with the legal requirements related to financial transparency by posting all required information. And then we got the, the five points. Indicator number 20, did the school district, did the school board members discuss the district's property values at a board meeting within 120 days, 20 days before the district adopted its budget? If the school district fails to indicate 20 of the maximum points and highest rating, the school district may receive its 89 points again, which would be above standard. The response is down. I asked you discuss the property values at a board meeting within 120 days before adopting its budget for fiscal year 2020. This indicator, this indicator measures whether the school board had the opportunity to consider the impact of changes in property value on the finances of the district. And again, it was yes. So we, uh, Donna ISD received a perfect score, uh, an A grade, uh, uh, another year, a consecutive year. And this and thanks, of, of course, I was not here last year, so the credit belongs to Ms. Ludivina Cancino. And of course, Mr. Jerry Cavazos, who's our current uh, finance director, he was he was a uh, county supervisor at the time, and of course, all the business department, and of course, the board. Any questions? That concludes them. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Perez. Just one yes, question: uh, How are we doing with the internal audit? We're still on schedule. We're on Is schedule, it? sir. Good. Yes, we'll be here on the first week, the first week of November. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. The time is 5.43, and we're going to go ahead and move into our regular board meeting. If we can please all stand for the pledge and a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. Before we get started with the regular board meeting, uh, before I even go into the open forum, I want to take a minute just to welcome a very special guest that is currently sitting in our audience. And at this time, I'd like to uh, recognize her. That's Angela Dominguez, our new superintendent of schools, who officially begins tomorrow. <laughs> Welcome, Ms. Dominguez, to Don ISD. All right, we're going to go ahead and move on to open forum. Uh, but before we move into open forum, I'd like to just read uh, what is required. It says the next item on the agenda is public comment. Before we begin, I will remind our audience members of the board's procedures for handling public comment. The public comment portion of our meeting is available to members of the public who wish to address an agenda item to be considered by the board on tonight's agenda. 
Anyone who wants to speak during public comment must sign in prior to the start of the meeting and list agenda item or topic they want to discuss. Each public comment speaker will be allowed a maximum of three minutes, which will be the time will be maintained by our legal to address the board for each designated agenda item. However, any public testimony speaker who requires a translator will receive up to six minutes to address the board. The public comment portion of the meeting will allow all speakers who have signed up before the start of the meeting to address the board regarding an item on tonight's agenda. Please keep your comments or criticism civil and courteous. Please avoid using profanity and refrain from making personal attacks on others during your opportunity to speak. Lastly, we ask that you do not discuss students who are not your own child. If a speaker is seeking board resolution of a specific complaint, that concern should be addressed through the district's grievance process. District policy DGBA has been established for addressing employee complaints. Policy FNG is the avenue for filing parent complaints and policy GF addresses community member complaints. Grievance forms can be obtained at any campus administration office or in the central administration offices. Thank you. Our first speaker is Vero Devino on 4B6 Virtual Learning. Ms. Vera, Vera Devino. Yes. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Okay, this is about my oldest daughter, <clears throat> and this is pertaining to item, um, shoot, it's about virtual learning. <clears throat> so my oldest daughter fell victim to adverse effects from vaccines, and she's now suffering from Asperger's syndrome. Um, seeing her go through daily challenges every day is something that I have to live with, and is very difficult to forgive myself for. Um, she would always get bullied daily, you know, um, because she was different, and that's completely unacceptable. This is this pertains to the remote learning public. It's a public announcement. Um, from 1918 to 1930, millions and millions of ineffective vaccines were administered in the United States as a means to stop the Spanish flu, because researchers thought that influenza was a bacterial infection. If we have yet to eradicate the influenza, what makes anyone think that we will do so for COVID? Why would anyone push for this experimental jab for our children when it has already done so much damage? <clears throat> we need to stop advocating for these experimental jabs. We need to stop forcing them on the, your employees. And we need to get this injection, I'm sorry, we need to stop forcing your employees to get this injection in order to keep their jobs. And I refuse to be an experimental monkey, much less my children, after vaccines have already made devastating effects to my family. Remote learning was brought to our children without notice, so do not expect their grades or test scores to be anywhere close to normal. Do not push par parents to vaccinate our children when we're having similar issues, adjusting to such a heavy shift. Their lives were changed drastically overnight because of the COVID vaccine, I mean, the COVID pandemic. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Juanita Townsend on item 6A. Correct. Good evening. I am here today on behalf of the Texas Light Guardians, the community which you serve, as well as some um, employees who may fear losing their jobs for what I'm about to discuss today. Um, it is my understanding that tonight you'll be discussing hiring and termination recommendations that was on the agenda. Therefore, I want to remind you that faculty and staff should not be terminated for refusing to wear a mask or, nor for refusing to get vaccinated. First of all, you shouldn't force employees to wear a mask. 
Executive Order GA38 states no governmental entity, including a county, city, school district, and public health authority, and no government official may require any person to wear a face covering or to mandate that another person wear a face covering. This executive order supersedes any county order that you may have been following. TEA's public health guidance on, that was published on September 17th now states school systems cannot require students or staff to wear a mask. That is per the GA38 that they are referencing there. The Texas Education Code 37.0023 prohibits, and I quote, impairment of the student's breathing, including any procedure that applies pressure to the torso or neck or obstructs their airway, including placing an object in, on, or over their mouth or nose, or placing a bag cover or mask over the student's face. If such is considered an aversive technique for a student by Texas law, then it is an inappropriate expectation for visitors to any campus or employees of the district. Furthermore, you shouldn't fire nor force employees to resign due to not wanting to take an experimental vaccine. The newest executive order 40, GA40 states, no entity in Texas can compel receipt of a COVID-19 vaccine by any individual, including an employee or a consumer who objects to such vaccination for reason of personal conscience, based on a religious belief or for medical reasons. To my knowledge, there is at least one English teacher in your district who was forced to resign by not letting her sign her contract at the beginning of the school year because she didn't want to wear a mask. As a result, you are also short on substitutes from what I've been told. So you had other teachers giving up their conference period to cover that one teacher who you guys didn't want to hire back just because she wanted to just not wear a mask. That's time, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Our next speaker is Michael Palafox on legal consultation. Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much. This is a privilege to be here. And uh, I am here to advocate for especially our children. And I have to say that I do concur with the first two women who came to express their, their concerns. And uh, I am just right along with them. My name is Miguel Paula Fox. Uh, I'm here to present new evidence from patents issued to federal agencies, employees, pharmaceutical companies, and this includes uh, activity of FDA recall of PCR testings and results. My topic is here to, as I guess you could say, instrumental to legal consultation to the panel here. Uh, I hope that my information will be taken at face value as new evidence of criminal activity is surfacing daily. As community, we must consider how this activity impacts us all at every level, i.e. schools, hospitals, and military, et cetera. For instance, uh, we're beginning to hear news how schools are being impacted, just as the two ladies indicated. Uh, people are very fearful of this so-called jab. Uh, the military, about 70%, maybe a little less than 70%, are beginning to renege the vaccination for very obvious person, uh, reasons. I, myself, in a, a statistic as a young Marine back in 76, I took the swine flu vaccination, and now, of course, I'm suffering from degenerative joint disease. It was experimental. My shoulders, my wrists, my elbows, and my fingers, they flare up, and they're very painful. Among other side effects to this vaccination, the swine flu, um, uh, fibromyalgia, uh, Parkinson's disease, 
among other uh, other uh, diseases that are, are accompanied by this vaccination. Unbeknownst to me, uh, about a, a decade later, I came to find out that the United States Army, the government, had had uh, covered up this uh, this incident to where uh, three U.S. soldiers at Fort Detrick had passed away on account of these vaccinations. I am not willing to take another vaccination. And as I see it, uh, blue states, blue swing states are beginning to punish parents for being vocal. And I think that is totally unconstitutional. I don't think we, the American people, are going to stand up for it. Uh, we are fearful. I'm fearful for my, my, my children, my grandchildren. So, <clears throat> I'm here to advocate and to be the voice for children in our community. Children are not at risk as it relates to the COVID-19. Vaccinations should be absolutely be left to the prerogative of adults and not mandatory. Mainstream media is also complicit in promoting vaccinations and masks. That's time, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I hope you will take this at face value. God bless. Thank you. Our next speaker is Juan Rodriguez, NBG. Um, what was, what item would that be on the? Oh, I wrote down regular board meeting. I didn't, I didn't want to get anybody. Okay, but what item was it uh, on? It was agenda item 4B6. Okay, thank you. I'm here to chew bubble gum and drop some knowledge, and I'm all out of bubble gum. Good evening, Board of Trustees, Acting Superintendent Castaneda, and to everyone else watching and those in attendance. My name is Juan Rodriguez. I'm a parent of four, three attend elementary school at Lenore. Why is Donna ISD electing to offer remote learning for students? It's an important question. Under SB 15, no local education agency is required to offer remote instruction. It says that they may. Okay. Most children, parents, and staff were anxious to learn that 100% in-person instruction would be offered, but remained curious as to which measures would be implemented in response to this novel coronavirus. After all, fear and coercion are being used every day as a weapon to control our behavior. <coughs> this fear, however, is unfounded and baseless. Students have a higher chance of dying on their way to school from an accident than they do from dying from the disease caused by SARS-CoV-2. This is a fact. Currently, there are policies and protocols that have been needlessly implemented by the school district, which require the quarantining of close contacts, even if the unvaccinated contact does not have symptoms, with or without a negative test. This is in the protocol. Did we implement these policies during the influenza outbreak of 2017, 2018? Ask yourself that. 643 pediatric deaths resulting from pneumonia and influenza were recorded for that flu season between the months of February 2020, okay, and March 2021, there have been 332 deaths in the same age group. I've shared this information with one of your assistant superintendents, okay? And that's for the age group zero to 17, pediatric age group. The current protocol indicates how a close contact is defined. I could get into all the details, but for the sake of time, just know that the close contact definition claims an exception for K through 12 students who are properly masked in a classroom setting. Teachers, staff, or other adults in the classroom setting do not fall under this exception. What the protocol seems to correctly portray is that children are less likely to spread and develop the symptoms of the disease known as COVID-19. The entire basis for excluding children from being considered close contacts rests on the notion that wearing a mask will prevent the spread of the virus. This is where the protocol gets it completely wrong. There is irrefutable evidence that clearly shows that mask usage does not correlate with the reduction in the spread of COVID-19. The Danish study published in the Annals, the Annals for Internal Medicine clearly show this to be true. In fact, there is evidence that shows it causes more harm and may result in the unintended short-term damage, such as bacterial pneumonia and unforeseen long-term effects in the social and behavioral development of children. I call on this school board today to follow evidence-based science backed by randomized controlled trial studies the gold standard for measuring interventions. I also call on the board today to vote and to commit to changing the mask policy from, man from mandated to encouraged. In the movie They Live, 
Nada, the character played by Roddy Piper, finds a pair of sunglasses that help him see the world for what it is. Peeling back the layers that make up our onion of a society, it can be challenging, but together we can expose the corruption That's and ill-guided measures if we arm ourselves with truth. Out of every That's trial sir, and tribulation time, comes triumph. Sir, the time. Thank you, sir. and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And the next speaker is Laura Rodriguez on item 6F or... Laura Gutierrez. Is, is that you, ma'am? Yes, you may, you may come up. Good evening. My background is in education and counseling, and I have some questions. Do y'all really believe that what you're doing is in the best interest of our children? I'm here to inform you that our schools and local government have failed our children miserably. You were elected for the people, by the people, and you have created an environment for our children that is not conducive to their development. You are not medical doctors or scientists, so stop acting as if you are. Your job is to educate, inspire, and empower our children. They are our responsibility when it comes to their physical and mental well-being, not yours. We've had enough of your mandates and tyrannical policies on our children. You have forgotten that our God-given rights are protected by the United States Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And here's a small civics lesson for those of you that have forgotten. The proper flow of authority is God, man, society, and then finally, government, not the other way around. When was the last time you actually read the Constitution? I suggest you get yourself a copy. Our founding fathers knew this would happen one day, and it was written to protect we the people from elected officials like you. You dishonor a flag when you pledge allegiance because you do not abide by our Constitution. Our men are created equal. All men are created equal, and they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But some of you seem to have ignored our God-given rights. We have decided to take back our freedoms and advocate for our children and grandchildren. Shutting down our schools and then forcing them to wear face diapers and social distancing them from each other has caused severe emotional harm to them. I have personally experienced it with my teenage daughter. They lost a year of their youth and no one can bring it back. Teen years are hard enough as it is and no one wants to talk about the rise in suicides last year. Our children just want things to be the way they were, but you continue to push your agenda and for the love of money. Yes, we know it's all about the money and control. Have you wondered why enrollment is down? Parents are homeschooling because schools have become a business and have stopped teaching true education. As leaders, you should, you should do your own research and you will find that what is happening in our schools and government should worry all of us. If we do not stand up for our freedoms now, our children and grandchildren will pay for our compliance and ignorance. Our nation was built on exceptional principles that were held sacred to our founding fathers in our founding documents. Principles of liberty, freedom, morality, and equality, and derived from our creator, almighty God. I am here to tell you all that they are still worth fighting for, and you can mandate all you want, but we will no longer comply for God and country. Amen. Thank you. Our next speaker is Art Flores on virtual learning. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Mrs. Dominguez, respectfully, my name is Arthur Flores. But in the spirit of the month of October, I come to you as Dr. Joseph Mengele, resident of Auschwitz, Poland. 
also known as the angel of death. Is the reason for the remote learning program because students cannot safely learn face to face with a teacher in the classroom, which is clearly the most effective way to learn? Is the reason for remote learning because you have to spend some of the $100 million you've received from the American Rescue Plan? Yes, sir. Why is it not safe to learn? Is it because the students, the children, are likely to get COVID and die? This is clearly a lie. Children's survivability from COVID is greater than 99.9%. It's almost zero. I mean, their, their rate of death is almost zero. A former Pfizer executive, Pfizer, said that children are 50 times more likely to be killed by the COVID shot than they are to be killed by the virus itself. You'll see the numbers in just a minute. VAERS, V-A-E-R-S, is the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. Adverse means something bad happened. It's been around since 1990. It is a voluntary reporting system. It's been estimated to account for only 1% of actual vaccine injuries. VAERS uses HHS data, that's Health and Human Services. It's also co-sponsored by the CDC and the FDA. You can look for VAERS by searching or typing in openvares.com and in the menu you'll find an area that says look for the red boxes. These are the red boxes and that's what it looks like. I'm only going to mention three or four of them because I, I don't have enough time in three minutes. VAERS reports as of October 1st, 2021 and they, they update it every week. 16,300 deaths, 7,600 heart attacks, 8,000 600 myocarditis, pericarditis. These are diseases that affect mostly young children, teenagers. 23,712 permanently disabled, and I could go on and on. By the way, one of those 16,000 deaths happens to be this boy who is from my, where I was raised in Edinburgh? That's time, sir. That's time. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Our last speaker is Miguel Escobar on virtual learning. Hello, board. Nice to meet you all. My name is Miguel Escobar. I'm a physician assistant. I've worked at the Heart Hospital and all the hospitals over here in McAllen, also at the Border Patrol at one of the big tents that is a very disturbing thing here in Donna, okay? I worked there until I got fired because exactly what I'm doing right now, speaking the truth. What is the motive here? False narratives. Why are you creating a virtual learning program when it's based off of false narratives? Doctor, you should know yourself that that N95 that you're using actually does not stop everything that comes in to your breath. We already know that the studies that the CDC uses is based off of minimal amount of people. We're talking about 100 to no more than 200. And they literally said, oh, masks worked because we asked people to do a survey. And they said, yeah, I felt like the mass works. That's what the CDC is using. Let me show you a randomized control trial that was done in 2015, what the conclusion is for cloth masks. This study is the first RCT, randomized control trial, of cloth masks and the results caution against the use of cloth masks. This is important finding to inform occupational health and safety. Moisture retention, reuse of the cloth mask, and poor filtration may result in increased risk of infection. Let me go to another one. This is a this is on PubMed, PubMed doctor. Here's another one, a huge randomized control trial that included 30,000 people looking at a pandemic type of, of uh, issue with the masks. 
Here, let's, let's read. In this review, we did not find evidence to support a protective effect of personal protective measures or environmental measures to reducing influenza transmission. Why are we ignoring the facts? Okay, you should know, doctor, that influenza, if we looked at it on a microscope, is about this big. If you looked at coronavirus, it's this big. If the mask cannot control influenza, why do you think that this pathetic thing in front of me or the things that you're wearing on your face is going to help it from getting in you? And then we have the VARS report, which is showing that this is the most dangerous vaccine that's ever been given in humanity. And they're hiding the numbers. There's lawsuits right now showing that in a matter of three days, whistleblowers working that are doctors working with the CDC showed that within three days, 40, over 45,000 people died of the vaccine. And what are they doing? They're hiding the numbers. Why do here the people in Donna not know about this? Because they're hiding the information. Don't be in the dark. I have never worn a mask in the border patrol. No one died in the border patrol. No one's vaccinated. Their immune system's to the ground. Okay. What are they not telling you? That people in Donna are some of the most unhealthiest people in the valley. Because that's the truth. And why don't they tell us to live healthy? Because you're using money Time, and you will be sir. exposed and you Time. have received the Omega brief, Time, sir. which is sir. showing sir. criminal Time. activity, which you are Time, a part sir. of. Time. Okay. I believe that is all for open forum. We're going to go ahead and move on to the superintendent's report. Item one, district highlights. Uh, Ms. Castanera? Yes, ma'am. Let me go up there. Good evening, members of the board and community. I would like to start off with our district highlight segment with a video of a run, run virtual learning academy. As you know, the district held its ribbon cutting ceremony on September 27th to celebrate the transformation of Run Elementary into the district's first virtual campus known now as Run Virtual Learning Academy. In addition to Donna ISD's school board members, administration and staff, we also had representatives from the city of Donna and South Texas College joining us for the celebration. As far as we know, Don ISD was the first public school district in the Valley to designate a school solely as the virtual campus. So here's a brief video of the ceremony. Thank 
job. Thank you. Next, we have another highlight for you. Uh, board members, as you know, JW Caceres Elementary was transformed into JW Caceres Discovery Academy. And this year marks the first year the students are learning under this concept. We are very proud of the staff and students as they delve into this new and innovative learning experience. Our students are learning a broad range of academic and technical skills that will prepare them uh, for a tech-driven future. And here is the video of that highlight. The students are very excited and eager about these classes, not only robotics, but our coding classes as well. We do see our students progressing not only in the robotics hands-on class, but as well as in our coding class in the Code Monkey program. They are going uh, through the program eagerly and they're excited to enter those classrooms and learn new things. I believe students love what we do. Every single day that they come into class, they come excited because they're learning about something that makes them powerful. What we've seen is that when students are able to take things out of the box, they are able to do really well in all of their classes. We can see the, the way that they're learning. We can see how they, their capacity of learning and achieving their goals is, go, is going beyond. They're gonna be beyond the normal kid that is not able to interact with this kind of robotics like we're doing right now at uh, JWT Discovery Academy. The parents have shown a lot of excitement. Every time we post items on our class dojo uh, story from our robotics classes, from our coding classes, we have a lot of positive uh, remarks. We have a lot of hearts that are our likes in our class dojo. So we do see our, our parents that are also engaged in that and that they tell us that their children want to come to school because they want to achieve in those classrooms. Up to now, we've had a good turnout in our attendance where the students are coming to school because they do want to go to their discovery classes. And that concludes our district highlights for this board meeting. Thank you, Ms. Castaneda. That's awesome. Fantastic. Uh, moving on to item number two, August LSG monitoring report, go to GPM 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, superintendent evaluation of go to and next step, superintendent constraint two and CPM 2.1. Um, yes, we have uh, Mr. Javier Villanueva, who's our executive director for data, who will be presenting this report. Mr. Villanueva. <coughs> Thank you, members of the board. As uh, Dr. Valdez said, I'm Javier Vena, the, the new executive director for our data. And I'm here to present uh, board goal two uh, for October 2020. Um, I will be on, on Google uh, site, so I yeah, hope you all can follow along. Uh, as you know, uh, board goal two uh, talks uh, about the reading, the expectation of the third grade students meeting or exceeding the, the goal, the reading proficiency goals uh, up to 2025, uh, trying to increase their rate from 32 to 41 uh, percent uh, over the, those following those years. Um, they went ahead, the board, and, and broke down that particular goal into three segments. Um, on 2.1, it goes backwards, goes from second down to third kindergarten. Um, the second uh, grade students will improve their reading scores from 40% to 70%, uh, up, uh, I guess, in, in 2025. Uh, the first grade students will increase their proficiency uh, reading uh, from 31 to 70% uh, by two, uh, 2025. And kindergarten students will improve their reading uh, skills uh, from 69 to 80% by 2025. Uh, those are the goals. and. Uh, I kind of, I was given this uh, responsibility about two weeks ago, and I didn't want to change too many things because I, you know, I, I'm not coming in and trying to change things. I just, I want to get some uh, ideas to how you want this information presented. So maybe uh, in the future with our new superintendent, she can guide me as to how 
this data can be best presented, but this is the way it has been presented the last uh, few months, so I'm gonna just use the same format. Uh, and goal, to, uh, goal uh, two uh, for reading, uh, the percentage of third grade students that meet or exceed the, third, uh, the grade level proficiency on the, the star reading will increase from 32 to 41. Uh, there is several goals here. You can see the data table. It uh, represents the various goals from uh, this year, 21-22, uh, which is 34% going all the way to 2025 to 41%. And you see the various goals uh, for second grade, first grade, and kinder. Um, it does note here that the 2019 data, uh, the data was the baseline uh, and that 2020, because of the COVID pandemic, uh, it was somewhat incomplete. Um, for this particular segment, um, for the data for uh, kinder through second, uh, we had decided to use Amplify, which is an adaptive program, computer program. Uh, last year, uh, the district was using Imagine Learning. Well, the district doesn't have Imagine Learning anymore. So we wanted to make sure that we provided a program or data from a program that is kind of consistent with the state uh, early childhood data system. We submit that via that uh, program so for the kindergarten. So we want to use it and kind of stay consistent with the data. So. Uh, we got apples with apples instead of, you know, maybe uh, showing different sources of data. Uh, for third grade, however, uh, for this particular uh, um, data set, we used the recently administered uh, third grade BOY assessment. Uh, basically trying to let you know that uh, where our third grade students uh, stand at this particular point. Uh, we will be presenting uh, the English and Spanish separately, uh, so I'll get, I'm going to get started. Uh, here again is our goal for third grade students, uh, from 32 to 41 percent. This is um, a graph that kind of shows you various things, um, and I am recommending uh, that we change the format of this particular graph, but just to kind of make it easier to understand, um, if you look at, um, our, at the data table where it says all students, uh, there is a slightly blue table right there on Q1 going down to the right, which says Q1, 21, 22. The all student population on this bench, this uh, uh, beginning of the year assessment uh, at the meets level, only 5% met that criteria. In the Hispanics uh, population, 5% uh, uh, met that uh, criteria. Economic disadvantage was four. Uh, early learners was 3% and 0% of our special ed met the meets criteria for this particular assessment. And those data points that you see circled is what, on the second circle, on the, on the right-hand circle, is the data set. The next uh, points on the right-hand side of that uh, right side circle, oval, is basically our goal. So you can see the, the discrepancy or the difference between where we're at and where we need to be. Um, so uh, if on your, when you get this interactive, you can uh, just click on this, on the little link there, and it takes you to the data, um, and all the, uh, I have them separated by, uh, by campus, uh, and it tells you, it shows you, it highlights the, the meets percentages of each of the campuses, and this happens to be the English version of the BOY. So, Mr. Villanueva, it's very evident then that we as a board need to probably meet and revise our goals because there's, I mean, like if I'm looking at the all students who are currently at 5%, we, there's no way we're going to make it to 34%. So it's obvious that we have to. Yeah, there's two things. Yes, there's two, two things that we need to consider is that the actual goals themselves, what we've been through for the last, you know, 19, 20 months. Uh, we need to consider that and, and, and find out, uh, well, we, obviously we, we are at the 5% rate at this particular assessment. However, there's other assessments that we can utilize to determine, um, you know, to maintain some consistency with the data yeah. um, and um, kind of give us a, a, an idea as to how much they're growing throughout the year. Uh, this is the English version. You can tell by the, the title. It's, I'm sorry it's a little small, but it's, this is the English version of the BOY. Uh, this is a second. This is a Spanish version version and you can see that the data is even uh, it's a little bit it's lower it's at zero percent across the board from all students down to a special ed student population uh, this is remember this is very important that it's at the meets or mm -hmm. a master's level so it's not right. at the approaches level what, what 
particular assessment was used? Uh, this was actually um, what C and I decided to do is to, to administer a, a, a BOY of the grade level be prior. So this okay. particular case, they use a second grade star based assessment. So okay. it was actually at the rigor of star at the second grade level. Got it. So they wanted to know exactly where the kids left off last year and to be a good starting point for this year. Uh, and every every page has a, a interactive link up there, and the, you can see the various campus data um, um, that make up this this summary. Uh, the next uh, 2.1 uh, goal goal board uh, board goal is to increase the the secondary students reading at or above uh, grade level, um, and this is when we're talking about kinder first and second. We had to use an adaptive program uh, that kind of measures measures the overall readability. Um, I know uh, Ms. Uh, Paulson and I discussed which assessment to use, and we decided to use the Amplify because the Amplify, if you all and you all are educators, some of you are educators, you know about running records, and you know how running records is very very uh, accurate with their reading assessments or reading levels, and Amplify is a computerized version of running records. So we felt it was very, um, uh, very telling as to where our students are at this time. So this is our second grade students currently uh, with the English version of Amplify, because Amplify does have English and Spanish, uh, which is another benefit. Mm -hmm. And you can see it ranges from all students to special ed, 30% uh, uh, down to 12% uh, for Q1. For, and you know, it's, a little, it's not where we want to be, but it's closer to the goal of 21-22, uh, which is 48 down to 27%. So it's a little bit closer uh, for the English version of the Amplify. On the Spanish side, uh, the data is not still not, I mean, it's lower, um, but there's still some uh, hope where we can try to get to that goal of 48%. So currently we're at all students 24, uh, 24, 24, 25, and special ed down at 11%. For the first grade reading, uh, using the same kind of program, going from 31 to 7 percent by 2025. Uh, and here's the English data. It's kind of kind of um, English language learners are, are kind of uh, lagging behind a little bit. Uh, there is a discrepancy. There's a, a little gap there between uh, the all population and that uh, 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 English learner. Uh, but the data ranges from 25 down to 22 percent and 14 percent for the English learner. Again, we're getting closer to the goal, um, and uh, I think it's actually a, a, some of these areas it is achievable as long as we may stay with the same data uh, type and um, you know increase our data population, we can uh, probably get there. That's first grade, right? That one right there. This is actually first grade English. Yes, ma'am. Uh, this is first grade Spanish, and uh, this uh, is a little bit lower. It's at 14% across the board, except for special education. It's down at 9%. Um, there is a, a good discrepancy there between the, the current data and the goal. And in a few minutes, uh, Stephanie Paulson will come up and, and discuss the, the how we're going to get our grades up, our scores up. Mr. Mr. Villanueva, do you by any chance on this first grade one, do you by any chance know, because I, of course the, the, um, the Spanish ones are way below, the gap is bigger. Do you know what percentage of the students tested were in Spanish? Just um, I couldn't see the, let me see. What percent of all the students in the first grade, I guess? Well, there was only 340 across the district that scored in Spanish. Oh, okay. So here's the total number of students that tested. That's Spanish. Um, yes, okay. this is Spanish. Percentage-wise of uh, the first graders, um, let's see, just to do a quick calculation, that's 340 for English, for Spanish, and 485, it's, it's oh, okay. about 40%, I think, yeah. of those who were tested. Mm -hmm. About, okay. Yeah. Okay, very good, excellent, thank you. Okay. So the last one is kindergarten. Uh, kindergarten, uh, the expectations are to improve their, their rates from 69 to 80%. Um, very ambitious goals. That's great. Uh, from two thousand two, when we get to two thousand twenty-five, uh, this is our data. However, our data. Uh, this is again based on Amplify. Uh, our data is showing uh, a significant uh, discrepancy between where we're at and where we want to be. 
Um, I do know there was talk, uh, I, I was in a meeting before where uh, there was a, a talk about going back to our 2020-21 goal, but uh, that's only a difference of 3%. I mean, I, yeah. you know, I, th I think we need to be looking at, instead of looking at grade levels, be looking at cohorts of students. Uh, every student coming in is gonna be a, have a different makeup and different needs. So by setting structured goals by grade level, you're missing that whole component about the, the individual student or that cohort of students, and you want them to grow as a group, uh, but not by a grade level. Grade levels, you know, you can have, uh, it's like our valedictorians, you know, one, one year you have a kid graduating as a valedictorian for, at 100 average, the, the next year is gonna be 104. I mean, just there's, the various cohorts are different, and we need to kind of tailor or look at our data and make, I guess, uh, sound goals based on the, the students coming up. That sounds very, very interesting. Now, are you talking about kinder only? Or? No, I'm talking about all grade levels. Uh, I did, a, there's another report that I have that, that shows our current fourth graders and how our third graders did and where the fourth graders land this year. Oh. So we can, you know, there's historical data. So we want to be able to track our students per year. So these come, this year's second graders, we want to uh, track them next year as third graders, not just compare them to every third grade group that we have. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah. I see what you mean. Yeah, that's good. I like okay. that. Uh, so this is our um, this is our kinder group. Uh, this is a kinder group in Spanish. Uh, it's a little bit higher. Uh, you do, I mean, there are more probably more kids testing in Spanish. Um, and there are some populations, uh, uh, there were some d discrepancies. I know special ed is a little bit higher here. Um, in the lower level, special ed students um, haven't really completely been identified yet. So you have a lot of speech only students mm -hmm. who, can very, who can take a test very easily and do very well. So that's why you see some more success in the special ed population. Um, spouse. Good evening, board members. So, um, like Mr. Villanueva said, my name is uh, Stephanie Paulson Garza, uh, for those of you that don't know me. And I am the um, new executive director for curriculum and instruction. This is approximately my fourth week, not that I am counting, but this is my week four um, in this position. And so um, I know that when looking at the data on the board goals, um, it, it often seems kind of, and it feels, especially in the past, you know, um, year and a half, almost going on two years, it feels very bleak. Um, and so, and it feels heavy. Uh, but I do want to say that I do have um, hope uh, in the data, and I do feel like the things that we're putting in place now um, and the way that we're tracking and um, developing systems to support teachers, I do think that we are going to see um, improvement. And it's not going to happen overnight, but I do have um, hope and faith and just a strong belief that that's going to happen. So. Um, to talk about uh, what we're um, doing specifically, and I was, I actually wanted to add another slide, um, and then I was told, no, we'll just keep it to the, <laughs> the one slide, so you can see it's kind of tightly packed in here. Um, but um, in talk, the very first thing that we've noticed um, a huge improvement, and I know that the RLA um, early childhood coaches and our RLA director are here uh, this evening, and they can uh, attest to the fact that the addition of teacher assistants um, in grades one and two um, has really been um, a great uh, thing for our district. And I know that not 100% of the um, classrooms in first and second grade have the TAs, on board, I think we're miss we have approximately six to seven vacancies for TAs, but that means that as of this school year right now, we currently have every pre-K through second grade classroom that have teacher assistance. Um, and so that was something, um, you know, that we were able to do with those ESSER funds. Um, and I, it's been a really, um, we're actually now seeing the impact that it's having um, in the classroom. And so that's a really good thing. Um, and so the addition of these teacher assistants, it's going to allow the teachers um, to help facilitate that high impact, small group, 
um, instruction, and that you know was the purpose and intent prior to this school year. Um, you know, we only had the teacher assistants in pre-K and kinder classrooms, and so the first and second graders. And I know I don't have a, a ton of time to digress, but I will just say that the very first week of school, we were out at the. Camp Take your time. We okay. really want to know everything okay. that you're doing. Okay. Don't, and you Thank have you. to do three or four slides. We'd love to hear what you're okay. doing because we you. know you do great things. So don't cut me off, Mr. Villanueva. <laughs> um, so that very first uh, week of school, um, I'll say we were all assigned out to the campuses. And one of the things um, I was in, I was uh, I, where they really need assistance on those first week of school at the elementary is always in like the early childhood hallway where you have the pre-K, you know, some of the kids will try to run out of the classroom. So you always have to like have someone there on guard. And so I was in that, uh, that hallway and there I was outside of a first grade uh, classroom. And so uh, the teacher had kind of popped out um, and there was a student that didn't want to stay in his seat anymore. Um, and so he was kind of like looking for help. That was before the teacher assistants had come into um, play before we got the ESSER funds for the district. And so uh, he popped out and he said this, I think he's having trouble. Uh, the teacher looked nervous. It was the very first day of school. So I said, you know what I'll take him I'll walk him around show him the library show him the different rooms and then I'll see if he can go back and so one of the first things I noticed with the student was that he was in very he was in kindergarten last year uh, pretty much all virtual um, he had not come in the entire um, school year um, even though a lot of the students were back his parents just didn't feel comfortable so his entire kindergarten year, it was remote learning. And so one of the things that I noticed was that um, he was not very verbal. And um, he was not um, articulating to me what he wanted, but he kept dragging me by the hand to take him to the computer lab, where the computer lab was empty. And he kept going to the computer. And this kid was really tech savvy, because he sat down at the computer, and he was going straight to log in with Google, because that's the, the setup that was on the screen. He went to log in with Google. And I finally could understand the words that he was saying he wanted to get into brain pop which brain pop if you don't know has those educational videos so you could tell that the student had watched a lot of brain pop videos and last year when the students were remote especially with the little ones it's so difficult to try and get student input and have them talking through Google meet um, and so I could see right then and there like you know the challenge that that teacher was going to face um, and so uh, I could see that you know the student had learned but again needed practice with that verbal that face-to-face -face instruction um, and that's one of the things um, that I think is not only the teacher assistants can help with you know talking to the students and having more interaction with them but with the amplified data um, this is the second year that we're using um, that we're submitting the amplified data through the the early childhood data system. Um, and what I like about it is that it's a teacher, it's not just an instructional program. Yes, it's adaptive and there's it's a program, um, but it's an actual teacher that's interacting with the student and that's um, getting that feedback from the student and can identify right then and there what letter sounds they can't um, pronounce. Um, and so it's all computerized so that way the teacher's not having to take like furious notes on that. Um, it's all, you you know, stored, and then at the end, it provides really accurate reports. Um, and the teacher assistants um, are going to be really critical for that data, that progress monitoring on that. Um, and so I, I just want to say that you know, when I saw that, I said this: the, the students, um, I'm never going to be uh, the type that believes that an instructional program is going to be better than a teacher. You know, the teachers teaching the students, interacting with them, talking to them, um, that's really what we're encouraging and focusing on. Um, and so the new teacher assistants, as soon as they came in, um, the RLA department held a training where all of the, the teacher assistants, it was virtual because it was like over 100 uh, people. And so during that training, they did, um, the instructional coaches did modeling um, on the Amplify lessons. And so their little mini lessons for the TA, and I actually brought one here with me with a little popsicle sticks for the letter, but I realized that's probably a long time. Um, but um, they, they modeled those lessons 
lessons for the new TAs coming in. And the great thing about those Amplify lessons is that it's completely scripted. So it literally says, like, boys and, uh, boys and girls, like, today I'm going to show, we're going to talk about letters, letter sounds. And so then the, the t teacher assistant would hold up a letter. And they would say, okay, you know, do not say the name of the letter. We know that the letter is R, but I want you to focus on the sound that this R makes. Um, and so it is scripted like that. Um, and so I was thinking, wow, like, you know, I, I substituted for elementary, was not brave enough to stay teaching elementary. I was secondary. Um, but I could see right then and there that the teacher assistants would be able to go into the classrooms and immediately implement that. Um, and so that's uh, something that I think is going to be just uh, such an important piece. And so I think that's, you know, on those first two bullets there. Um, and a good, uh, those are, you know, the, the things that are being implemented that I think are going to really help with the reading levels. Um, the lessons, they modeled them in both English. They did an English lesson, full blown, and then they did a Spanish lesson, full blown. Um, and so I think, again, that that was very beneficial. Um, and before even the school year had started, so that's, you know, of course we were, you know, not from the start did we have all the teacher assistants, but once the teacher assistants were on board, that's when that training was provided. Um, also, the, the, there was a progress monitoring training uh, for Amplify for teachers at the beginning of the school year, so during the August staff development, and that was for all K through second grade teachers. Um, and so, like I said, this progress monitoring, this is something that it's not just the EOY and then the MOY and then um, uh, the, the B, uh, no, B-O-Y, I mixed it up. B-O-Y, M-O-Y, and then uh, E-O-Y. There's actually every two weeks, there's short little progress monitoring um, components um, and that, that should be done, that need to be monitored. Um, and so that training was provided for all K through second grade teachers. Ms. Nelson, time out. Yes. Great. So is that something new right now? Every two weeks we're gonna do progress? Yes, that's what. And that, this is across the board? Yes. Okay. That's something new. See, I was kind of listening, and that perked my ears. And so, yeah. So, um, so uh, you can see that there, uh, there's a hyper, uh, hyper um, link um, that it has the progress monitoring calendar um, that the RLA department, you know, developed for the teachers that just focuses on the Amplify. Because like I said, they had the program, it, this is the second year, and this is a program that the TEA has made available for free for kinder, first, second grade, um, uh, all the way through the end of 2023. Um, and this is also the same program that's used for our mandatory dyslexia screener. So it's a complete reading diagnostic tool. Um, and so I don't think even though it was being used as that data submission last year, it wasn't the data that was being reported um, on the board goals as far as the reading level proficiencies. So really all the components are there, the progress monitoring pieces, all that, but it's just a matter of implementing it. Um, and so I think that they got off to a good start this year as far as providing providing all the training about the different components and setting up the progress monitoring um, calendar um, that tells the teachers when they're going to be um, doing that, that every two weeks. Um, and so uh, based on that training, you know, the RLA, the instructional coaches um, and, you know, the RLA department will be working closely with the teachers on the implementation of Amplify. Um, and they're going to continue to support teachers and teacher assistants by modeling lessons and lesson planning. I've been working with the entire CNI department, um, not just you know early childhood, but everyone on setting up our instructional like coaching schedule. So individual teachers, um, you know, we're not coaching by campus; we're coaching by individual teacher and the, the teachers' needs. And so um, it was exciting today because this was their first. They had been in the classrooms, kind of doing pulse checks before we sort of, um, you know, put together their, their final schedule for now. Um, and so right away, they came back with really positive feedback as far as the teacher assistance. And so, and then the, they said that, you know, they could see them right there um, being, you know, really effective and helping the teacher. And then the, the ones that weren't being as effective, those are the classrooms that they're going to be following up on. They're already on their coaching schedule, so now they know to follow up with them. Um, and so in addition to that progress monitoring calendar for the teachers, the RLA department is following up with that by 
going into the Amplify platform and seeing, you know, who has done their progress monitoring, who has not, and then following up with those teachers um, individually about, you know, hey, what's going on, making sure that the teacher's not struggling, um, uh, you know, in implementing anything. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so I think they're all around. Uh, we've really been able to, and I'm kind of, uh, skipping to my next uh, bullet here, but we've really been able to pin down one of the very first things that I did. By the end of the second week, we had already identified all of the kinder through second grade teachers in the district. And um, what we did was we placed them, we talked through each teacher and we placed them on a matrix, on a support level matrix. So we looked in, looked at quantitative data, we looked at qualitative data, what we know about that teacher, if the teacher had been moved recently from one grade level to the next, because we know that that happens, um, especially with the numbers fluctuating the way they were at the beginning. So all, taking into account all that data we were able to identify the level of support um, needed for each teacher and so from the 134 kinder through uh, second grade teachers we were able to pinpoint 73 teachers that are uh, no 72 teachers that are considered high priority um, at, for check-ins and so and kind of scheduling them across so it is a lot of um, teachers for for one um, you know, for three uh, coaches, um, but I think split up amongst the RLA department, I think that, you know, it'll it'll be effective. Um, but I think just getting that grasp and that handle on exactly how many teachers mm -hmm. and the level of support that's needed. Or is it just a teacher that needs check-ins here and there, or they might need a resource that you can get for them, something to print for them that's in color, you know, in that grade level, that's an important thing. Um, and so, so for some of those teachers, it's just like a customer service approach, and then some of them it's like a deeper coaching level um, and so I, I think that um, that that has been beneficial um, there was also a specialized eye station training that was provided um, it, that was in collaboration with the bilingual department um, for um, campus uh, leaders and computer lab managers um, showing them really how to like dig in and run instructional reports um, that can just be used as part of you know instruction if they're doing small group instruction then that's something that they can work on in iStation um, again just all in an effort to like build everyone's knowledge about how to really uh, optimize the the use of those programs um, and so, yeah, and that's over that I'm like my last bullet. I kind of talked about the the support level matrix. We also did that for because this does involve a third grade. We did this for all star grade level teachers as well. So all third through high school teachers. Um, there's uh, when you spread it across twenty across twenty star exams. That equates to three hundred and eighty teachers. And so for the CNI team, for the core team. And that's 380 teachers. We've placed them all on a support level matrix. Um, and so out of those 380 teachers, we've identified that there's about 188 um, that are it considered high priority because they may have been new to the content. They may have moved from fifth grade uh, reading to third grade reading. Um, and so, you know, on that, that's how that matrix is what's driving our um, individual director and strategist um, coaching schedule. Excellent. And so is there any other questions? Any questions? I do have some questions and here goes to to uh, the different things that you guys are doing which is great. The the only issues that I have and I've asked this before is when it comes to to testing or it comes to evaluating any student whether we're using ice station or other means whether it's Amplify now so every every time that we've since I've been here on the board, it's changed, has been modified. The only thing that has not changed is ice station. Uh, ice station, when we talked, and when I talked before about ice station, it was a tool that was given by TEA at one point to, for us to utilize at our level. But ice station has not been has had the success for identifying successful students. And if if you go back in the historical and read the data for ice station, I can tell you that it's not very promising. Okay. So now you go to Amplify, right? And you're using another system. So here, here's what I'm getting at. We're confusing, I think, sometimes information to what we're trying to get to. The bottom line is the goal that we want to get to, period, across the board. So now we're having a goal within goals 
um, and I have I have an issue with that because if we're having if we have identified as a board as a whole right what we need and what we require to get us to the next level given the last 18 months 19 months that we've had from COVID has affected that so Dr. Maman obviously needs to get back on board with us as a board to make sure we identify what things that we need to be predictive uh, by putting measures just to to cover an area and, and I don't want to sound condescending because that's not my, the purpose I think for me is really is how can we assist as board because when we looked at the, at the at the goals for for us we looked at what is the cost behind that and when we talked about the cost is what that effect <coughs> comes to a teacher and then it comes obviously to the staff support and I think that's what uh, uh, Dr. Valdez and Mr. Castillo were alluding to earlier is what is it that we're doing to affect the teacher well I can tell you these teachers that I've met and I've talked to are not very happy the way they're doing business and we can talk that offside I'm not going to take a lot of time with the board but I think it's important for us to kind of touch on those issues because we have not talked to all teachers I can guarantee you that you know you know we have the teachers but you have not talked to all of them uh, that I can guarantee you because I've, I've talked to a lot of teachers some of them are actually family members right and they also do the reading part so there are things I think that we need to look deeper besides the data the data is good but we can always work numbers uh, I can tell you because I work numbers as well there's ways to do things and I think the systems that we have in place when it comes to I station or other amplify means right I don't think it produces 100% of the things we want uh, I think it's just a tool and a resource for us to get information but I think we need to get down to the nitty-gritty on how we can make successful students with what we have. iStation, I can tell you right now, I, I don't, I've never liked it. Um, and I can say it here in this forum, I've never liked iStation. Go back, you can go back and read the history of it. Uh, even TEA will tell you they don't like it. But yet, they continue to, to push iStation. Yeah, and I mean, it is an instructional program. And like I said, I don't think I'm not going to push any instructional program by itself. The reason for using Amplify, the, the data component for this purpose, was because it was already, it's already required as per House Bill 3. Um, and so because that's the data that's submitted to the state, every Tuesday Amplify syncs with TEA. Um, and so it, dump, it dumps basically all of Don ISD's data. Um, so that was already required, and the dyslexia component was already required. So kind of like what you were talking about as far as like the testing, but what are we doing with it? Um, it was like a way to, okay, this is the data that the state requires. It, made, it only made sense for us to use that data to gauge the, the reading level proficiency. Okay, I've got a couple of points here. Just only because this is a section that obviously is very important to, to all of us. And then after this, we go into consent is very quickly. So I think one, one of the things that, that is really important, and I'm just speaking in, uh, from, from my point of view as an educator, former educator, is that all the plans you, 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 you all discuss right now is great. And yes, we have these goals. And I understand very clearly that these goals are, gonna, are, are something that is, is not reachable. I mean, let's face it. But we do need to be looking at what's happening right now. Looking at the calendar, we are third week of the second six weeks. Okay. When I ask the question about are we doing the progress monitoring every two weeks, that's good. I think that's 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 uh, very powerful because I'll, I've said it in the past and I'll say it again: the district, the campus, the grade level, the teacher, go in the classroom, know the kids, know their special pops. Are they GT? Are they bilingual? Are they sped? Uh, what are they and that's how we're going to find that so having said all that and, and I, I like the fact that there seems to be more communication now with with the campuses um, the concern is this now I'm going to go copy probably to the opposite side of the coin here is how are we as a district and I'm just putting this question out there so y'all can look into it differently what is the absentee rate faculty wise at every campus grade wise at every campus and TA because if the teacher is out for whatever reason he or she has to be out number one the sub will be in there if we're able to get a sub I understand it's not just us it's valley-wide statewide I've got relatives in Austin they have the same issue so we need to really put all the cards on the table with this because we can have a golden plan but we also need to be very <coughs> cognizant and let's look at our central office and I know we're having our superintendent coming in and it's because is fully aware of this that we really need to be thinking out of the box. We can have the golden plan, but if the teacher of record is not present, 
he or she is, is, is we can't, that's why they're called substitutes, because they're just in the meantime. So there's really looking to all that, because uh, it, it'd be a shame that we're having this issue behind the scenes, and it hasn't been brought up as a true, true dilemma, because it's a, it's a statewide issue. So anything that we can do, obviously central office-wise, uh, they can bring it to us and to address that because, I mean, you know, we, we're behind with the kids, everybody in general, because of the learning, the learning gap that we lost. But our staff members, uh, it, it really is difficult for whatever rationale they're bringing, you know, they're gonna be out. And so we need to have some pl plan of action to keep that hand in hand, okay? But other than that, I'd really, really like to, to hear that two week progress because that's every single kid is gonna have some type of feedback from the teacher and so forth. Okay, thank you. And, and to add to Ms. Zurich, I see his point. I think teachers, not only that uh, are, are, not, are present for days, which teachers we have not hired, uh, and we need to look at also the, I mean, we're looking at the elementary, that's I think the focal point coming from the ground up, right? So if we're missing teachers, you know, then there's, there's an, obviously an appetite for that. And if that's, that's what we're missing and we're not having any hires, uh, or we're missing teachers, obviously after we've already given them a, a great amount of money and they're leaving us, then we need to find out why. I mean, we've missing a lot of teachers at North or some already at High, why are they leaving? Why is it that they're leaving our district? If we cannot keep them happy, what is it that we're not doing correctly at our level? And administratively speaking, is what is it that we're not doing that? Uh, we have a lot of vacancies, uh, and I'm sure that, you know, you and I have talked about that, um, and across the board. So I just wanna make sure that, you know, we're addressing that as well, on top of what Mr. Castillo just mentioned. So hiring teachers is just as important at all levels uh, to make sure that we meet those criteria that we just highlighted. Um, and I, I'm not sure what, what, what's missing or why our, our teachers are leaving after we give them a big <coughs> raise. And to me, that's, that's, uh, that's haunting. Because if we're giving raises to folks and they're not staying, that means we're not doing something correctly at, at our level. All right, so uh, we need to address that as well. I think the only thing that I wanna add, well, and going, I guess maybe feeding off what Mr. Colonel said, I think teachers are leaving all over, not just Donna. I think it's more of a, it's happening throughout the country, or at least that's what I'm seeing, that a lot of them are leaving. But what I do wanna uh, tell you is that I'm very pleased with the presentation for both of you. I did see a lot of high leverage practices that you've already put in place. For example, the identification of the high priority teachers in the upper grades and lower grades. You've got a big <coughs> head start, because now you know where to zero in, where you need to coach, where you, the support needs to be provided. I think that's a big one. Um, I also like the progress monitoring that you're gonna be doing every two weeks. I love the fact that you've provided training to the paraprofessionals already and you all actually went to see them, to support them. And I actually also like the way you presented the goals, Mr. Vianella, because I think like the little spirals and then like you put where we are and what our goal is, you highlighted it in blue. That's more of a visual, because sometimes I'd have to like be looking for it, but that visual quickly helped me like well, we're way apart from where we need to be. So I actually liked everything that y'all presented. Very impressed. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other questions? No, I, I do want to make a comment. I, I do want to thank Ms. Paulson and Mr. Villanueva for the exceptional work they've been doing these last couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been visiting every single elementary campus as Ms. Dr. Campbell has at the secondary level. And we've just heard great um, comments from our campus principals. Uh, where they're seeing the support uh, from our CNI department, as well as the, the support from the data that is easily accessible to them through, <coughs> through, a, uh, through Google, um, through the Google Drive. So, um, Mr. Rieno and Ms. Paulson, thank you very much. Yeah. And again, uh, Dr. Campbell and I can attest to that because we've been at every single campus mm -hmm. every single day. Yeah, so. Huge. yeah I, 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 asked, I let uh, the principals know if you need a, a report or something, just let me know and they're they, coming they, in. They have and they're been, coming so we'll in. be meeting on some, yeah. some requests. No, it's yes. great, it's great. Um, I wanna, if, if I may, just you one minute uh, uh, talk about, uh, you asked the question, you know, why are teachers leaving? Uh, Ms. Paulson and I, Ms. Mrs. Garza and I spoke to a teacher very candidly and she knew that we we're both listening in and she was very uh, emotional and uh, one of the things that we need to work on is, uh, and I brought this up already, and maybe coming up with a local-based substitute pool. I know we don't want substitutes, that we want our teachers, but we can't even find applicants to fill those vacancies. That's how hard it is at the campus level right now. Mm -hmm. And our teachers, for some reason, are just being absent, and we have between, I'm not kidding, between 30 
to 60% fill ratio of these substitutes. So it's very, very difficult and that's beginning at the high school levels, we have no choice but to maneuver teachers during their conference or in their planning, cover this class, cover that class. And so now they're complaining about not having enough time to plan. And that is critical because, I, uh, Colonel Pettis, you're right, we cannot replace the teacher. The teacher is the one that's going to be doing the teaching. No matter what programs we get, we cannot replace the teacher. So we need to do a better job with that. And I mean, we're here to get you all the information you need to, to so make those you, moves. Are you suggesting or maybe recommending? Because right now we use Region 1. Are you suggesting Region maybe? 1 right now does not have the capacity to completely fill our our. our our no, absences. But what I'm saying, are you suggesting maybe that we would be better off finding substitutes the way we had it before when we had our own pool? In addition At this point, I think we need to add. In, in addition to. In addition to. Oh, okay, I got you. In addition to right, okay. make it competitive. So we, we and they, Region 1 has their criteria. They, they provide TRS, they, you know, retirement. They have all these benefits, which is great. But some people are not interested in all that. Some are retired, they're, they they're loving life. They just want to do local, uh, right. you know, sh provide their support for their local schools. Mm -hmm. And there's just some way to, to help our teachers because they, they do need our help. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. All right, at this time, um, Mr. Castillo, do you accept or reject the report? Accept. Mr. Colonel? Accept. Mr. Where did he go? <laughs> Mr. Mr. Mrs. Watts? Mr. Reyna? Accept. And I also accept. All right, thank you. Right, We're going to go you. ahead and move on now to consent agenda. Uh, Mrs. Castaneda, I think there were some items there that you wanted to remove. Yes, or? Madam President. Administration recommends that the following items be removed from the consent agenda. And uh, they are from the business and finance section items number three and number 13. And from our human resources uh, item number one. And that no action be taken on those items, please. Right. Any questions? From Letter D, item number one. Is that uh, correct? Human resources? Yes, that is correct. Okay. Yeah, item one. Any questions? No. Okay. At this time, do I have a motion to like, uh, approve consent agenda as presented? So, what numbers were those again? I'm sorry. It's going to be uh, under consent. On the consent and agenda? Finance, business mm -hmm. and finance, number three and 13. And D1. And then under human resources, one. And one. the reasons why, why all those, I'm just curious. Ms. Castaneda? Um, on item uh, number three, there is a, a policy that we need to address first. On the item number 13, we'll discuss that in we, we will discuss that in executive. And for uh, D1, um, there is no longer a need for that item. Madam President, I make a motion to approve consent. Agenda is noted. Thank you, Doug. Second by Ms. Watts. Mr. Colonel, how do you vote? In favor. Mr. Valdez? In favor. Mr. Reyna? In favor. And I also vote in favor. Motion carries. Uh, moving on down to item five, governance, conservative monthly report for August 2021. Ms. Romero, you have the floor. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, Madam President, Ms. Castaneda, members of the board, the community. Today I have the August report under governance. You actually had a very busy month. You were, not only did you have the approval of the budget, approval of a tax rate, and the selection, or quite a few meetings for the selection of the superintendent. So that was a very, very uh, busy month for, for you as a board. Then moving on to the next section, we have the special accreditation investigation section and that has to do with mainly the HR report, uh, the, the HR section. Mm -hmm. But I need to tell you that and repeat to you that having the Mariposa Shelter hiring done by your own HR department put a big burden on your yes. HR department. Absolutely. And unfortunately, we didn't know it at the time when, when the district was going into it. Mm -hmm. But you know, you had a hundred plus employees through that program and then to go ahead and do all those uh, changes and so forth so that has placed a big big change of that and then the addition of all the ESSER funds which is great because you're you're using them well but you have about 95 teaching assistants that were hired 
So that's placed another burden on them. And then in addition to that, you have a lot of other positions. So it's been hard. Then in addition to that, you had the, assist, the, the HR uh, assistant superintendent temporarily assigned as acting superintendent, and you also had the director leave to be the Mariposa principal. So all of that transpired. I mean, it's not a surprise that we do have some issues there, but they are working very hard at getting it up to speed. So I do want to bring that to your attention. Now, in the financial, on the financial, actually, there's a lot of good things happening in the financial because you've approved a budget, you approved a tax rate, and you approved the pay raises, which you gave 2,500 to teachers, and then all the other people got quite sizable uh, percentages, up to 9% for your ancillary workers and so forth. And then in addition to that, you also uh, increased the self-funded insurance program from 505 contribution by, by the district to 550. And then you did retention stipends for your employees, teachers ranging at $3,000 and for all others, $2,000. So that's a really good thing. And then on top of that, your school first was presented today and you got a superior rating. So good things on the academic, I mean financial, on the financial. So then going on to, let me see, what do I have, the other one. On the academic, well, at, at that time, what we had going on was the virtual academies that they were just preparing and to go into the remote conferencing, which you designated <coughs> five campuses to do those. One for the elementary, two for the middle schools, and two for the high schools and then to start the high impact tutorials uh, which would start sometime in in the, in september from that standpoint and then i actually visited three campuses and i was very pleased to see what i saw it was so quiet and then um there was a lot of teaching going on and instruction going on and then the way they did uh, cafeteria where they rotate like seventh graders this week and then following week the sixth graders and they take turns and so forth that I mean a lot of order good things going on there and on the very last one which was my directives that I have on that one I had requested uh, for Miss Castaneda to pull the chief of operations position only because it had a very short timeline that uh, the assistant superintendent for business would have to interview. I think he had like 37 applicants and it closed on a Friday, the position. And he was gonna have to have a recommendation by Tuesday when the board meeting was gonna have happen. So I said, no, it's too short of a timeline. We need to give him more time and so forth because he was gonna have to spend the whole weekend just reviewing all those applicants and then trying to schedule and call those people in and to perform interviews and then re do reference checks, it's just too much. So it was a little unrealistic for the timeline. So I pulled that. And that pretty much concludes my report, unless you all have any questions. Mm -hmm. Questions, anybody? No? no. All right, thank, thank you, ma'am. Thank, thank you so much. Okay, the time is 7.07 .07 and we're going to move into executive session as authorized by the Texas Government Code Section 551 and 084. Time is 8.15 and we are back in executive we are back in open session to take possible action on matters discussed in executive session. Item A, discussion and possible action to approve superintendent's recommendation of personnel, approval of recommendation for professionals to include hiring and termination recommendations. Do I have a motion? So move. Okay, second by Ms. Watts. Colonel? Favor. Mr. Valdez? Favor. Mr. Reina? Favor. And I also vote in favor, motion carries. Uh, Ms. Castaneda, I'm going to go ahead and move over B and C to you. 
for recommendations. Uh, yes, ma'am. Administration recommends um, the employment for uh, our advanced academics director of, uh, or for Ms. San Juanita Franco. Do I have a motion? Motion. Motion by Mr. Reyna. Do I have a sec second by Ms. Watson? Mr. Castillo? In favor. Colonel? In favor. Mr. Valdez? In favor. And I also vote in favor. Motion carries. <clears throat> item C? On item C, the discussion and possible action to employer athletic, athletic director. Uh, administration recommends uh, Ramiro Leal for athletic director. Okay, I have a second. motion by Ms. Watts, second by Colonel, Mr. Castillo. In favor. Mr. Valdez. In favor. Mr. Reyna. In favor. And I also vote in favor. Motion carries. Uh, item D, discussion and possible action regarding Guerrero ETL versus Donna ISD, no action. Item E, discussion and possible action to approve the offer to employ new superintendent and confer authority to board president to execute contract. Do I motion by Ms. Watts. I second. Second by Colonel, Mr. Castillo. In favor. Mr. Valdez. In favor. Mr. Reyna. In favor. And I also vote in favor. Motion carries. Do I have a motion to adjourn? I want to discuss something before we oh. adjourn publicly. Okay. I know that this is the last meeting that Ms. Rebecca Castaneda, Castaneda will be doing as an active superintendent. And, and I know we just discussed this earlier, but uh, I want to go on record as well, like many of us here. Thank you for the hard work you did because it's a, it was this, it's a difficult time uh, not only here, but in the entire nation, uh, COVID and so forth, and bringing kids in. So, uh, from the bottom of our heart, it's literally, I say that because you're taking care of the district. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It, it truly has been my pleasure to serve, and I appreciate and, and I'm grateful for the vote of confidence and the trust that you all have placed in me. Uh, but I couldn't have done it without the support of, of our awesome um, directors that we have in place, uh, Dr. Campbell, Mr. Perez. Uh, Mr. Ngozo, everyone just everyone just came together as a team and together we, we continued the work. So uh, again, thank you all very much for, for that confidence that you had. Like I said, it's truly been a pleasure. Awesome. Thank you, Becky. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thank do, you. do I have a motion to Make adjourn? A motion to adjourn. Okay. Second. Colonel? In favor. Mr. Valdez? In favor. Mr. Reyna? In favor. And I also vote in favor. Motion carries. Meeting adjourned. Thank you.